Welcome everyone to Token Topics. I hope you all had a great Thanksgiving. I have an exciting XTC video in store for everybody. You're not going to want to miss this. We're going to dive into the world of XTC and trade. We're going to check out some more information on the Electronic Trade Document Act. We're going to actually hear from some experts. Also, I'd like to go over some information from Andre Kasterman about the DNI and a TFD and what 2024 is going to look like. There's an exciting year ahead of us. We're also going to dive into some more into the world of ISO messaging. We're going to learn about some standards that are currently being developed. It's all part of blockchain. Also, I'm going to explore Ply. If you're an XDC or Ply fan, you don't want to miss this. Please do hit the like, share, and subscribe so you can stay up to date. And remember, I'm not sponsored or paid for by Zinfen, the XDC community, or Ply. With that out of the way, let's dive in. This was posted from Andre Kasterman. Now, it is important to know if you're new to XDC, XDC Network is basically the golden blockchain for the DNI initiative and the TFD initiative. You also have Trade Tech, but that's built on the XDC Network. So the XDC Network is truly a revolutionizing blockchain for the trade industry. So Andre Kasterman posts, IFA FinTech Committee 2024, Priorities will deliver new role models to the trade industry. Engage with peers to establish the most advanced trade tech practices supporting originate and distribute practices. In agreement with our early adopters, we upgrade our level of ambition for 2024 in order to fulfill our mission, which is to establish new trade tech market practices to create a better global trade system. Two options across origination distribution. You have the DNI initiative and you have the TFD initiative, which, both of which XCC Network is heavily involved or part of. Engage, so you have the DNI initiative. Engage in a two-bank transaction on the basis of ETD Act or ADGM ETR and E-Bill of Exchange or E-Promissory Notes. You have the TFD initiative to engage in multi-seller securitization so institutional investors benefit from higher diversification, utilization rate, and yield. Let's dive into this article to learn a bit more. Just to refresh or recap for people that are new to XDC. So Zinfin's XDC network is the first blockchain company to join the global TFD initiative. And this points back to Andre Kasterman. So XDC network, a network utility providing smart contract uh, technology to produce cryptographic tokens has been selected to join the TFD initiative by FinTech veteran Andre Kasterman whose impressive track record includes over 20 years with SWIFT, leading various technology innovations at interbank payments, corporate payments, corporate treasury, and trade finance. Kasterman is responsible for spearheading the TFD initiative. All right, let's go back to the article. Following our laser focus on strategic industry-wide ambition since 2018, the IDFA FinTech Committee has grown to support a network of 70-plus FinTech members and has delivered dozens of early adopters involving top 10 financial institutions and asset managers. I want to stop right there. That is excellent because that expands the network for the XCC network. That expands the connections and the ability to use the technology. All right, so skipping ahead here, we've gone through that. Since the ideation phase of H2 2017, the FinTech Committee has succeeded to attract the most innovative legal business and technology experts whom gathered to develop guidance on key market developments and to deliver early adopters who together define the most advanced trade tech market practices as proof of points for the industry. All right, I want to show you this post from Son White of XCC Australia. And it's just a reminder that there is a lot to ISO 20022 than just digital assets. But we can throw digital assets out completely. We know it's about data and rich features. But digital assets, when they came into play, you know, this was all part of the major upgrade. So ISO has been around for a long time, all right, in case somebody is just wanting to get to, to learn this. ISO has been a messaging format for transactions for a very long time. So ISO 20022 was not only specially designed to upgrade for data and rich features, but also it was designed to add digital assets. So currently we are in a transition phase. If people are wondering, you know, why isn't the price explode or anything, there is a lot to it. I'm going to show you this post from Son White, and there's a lot of development still going on. So everybody, you know, that's good to know. So we are in a transition phase. 
So the reason why we haven't seen an explosion is because they're running parallel. Uh, you know, they're slowly hitting the gas, as I like to say. They're slowly implementing it, all right? When the time is right, the floodgates are going to open. So while initially developed for traditional financial transactions, the standard has now been expanded to include the world of cryptocurrencies. ISO 20022 brings standardization and interoperability to the crypto space, ensuring smoother communication between various platforms and participants. But, like I said, there's a lot more to it. Under development, standards matter as interoperability is at stake for blockchain and a broad and emerging digitalization of industries. We all know or have heard about ISO 20022 and networks like XTC Network uh, by, are facilitated by Impel. We also have XRP Ledger, Hedera, Cardano, Stellar, truly leaning into data-rich messaging formats, but there is much more being done. Very important to have these put in place for global synergies and adoption to really blossom, thanks to all those standard space for providing the necessary expertise and attentiveness to ensure fintech is practical and continues to be even more universal. All these standards being developed right now, you got ISO DTR6277, blockchain and distributed ledger technology, data flow models for blockchain and DLT use cases. You got ISO AWI TS181286, smart contracts, taxonomy and classification. You got ISO AWI2043-5, representing physical assets using non-fungible tokens. You got blockchain and distributed ledger technologies, vocabulary under ISO22739. ISO AWI TS23353, you got blockchain distributed ledger technologies auditing guidelines. You got ISO WD TS23516, blockchain distributed ledger technologies interoperability framework. You got ISO AWI PAS24874, guidebook on the use of smart contracts and contributing to the sustainable development goals. You got ISO AWI TR24878. New and emergent DLT blockchain use cases. As you can see right there, there is a lot to ISO. Maliter is a very important act that went into law not long ago to help mold and transform the future of digitalization of international trade. So it is very important. And believe it or not, some people might not know this, but the XTC network was kind of like a base sort of to help form and mold this law. So very important for the success of the XTC network and other blockchains um, that we're going to be seeing. So here, let's go ahead and take a look and see how this act can transform digitalization of international trade. As you can see, uh, she she tagged Andre Kasterman and you can see she also um, hashed XTC. Welcome to part one of our two part series on the Electronic Trade Documents Act 2023. Digitalization of trade has been a major hot topic in the world of trade finance for a number of years. Moving away from slow and archaic paper-based processes has been a priority, but one fundamental hurdle to this has been certain legal blockers. The Electronic Trade Documents Act set to fix this from an English law perspective and hit the statute books about six weeks ago. It's a huge step forward for digitalization of international trade, Given that English law governs an estimated 80% of international trade transactions, it will be a huge catalyst in the efforts of the industry. So, Rogier and Alex, maybe I'll turn to you first. What was the business case for the Electronic Trade Documents Act? Thank you, Catherine. Well, it's great to be here. Looking forward to the discussion today. Um, perhaps I'll start, but jump in, Alex, as well. I guess from my perspective, before we even go into the business case, Unless you sort of are in the inside of the trade world, it's difficult to imagine that we still have all these bits of paper floating about the system every day. And uh, different estimates exist, but we think about 28 billion pieces of paper are floating around the world every single day in support of international trade transactions, which is crazy if you think about it. So before you even get into the economic business case, just getting all this paper out of the system, moving to um, 2023, really, the digital world feels like a, a sensible thing to do. But you can imagine all of this paper being in the system slows down the system as well, makes the system less efficient. 
and the Electronic Trade Documents Act that we saw being enacted in the UK this year, we believe will have great benefits to the economy and to UK businesses and international businesses as well. And just to bring that to life a bit, the ICC here in the UK have done some analysis and, and they believe that the law change can generate £25 billion in economic growth for the UK alone, which is huge. They also believe that the law change will be a real enabler for supporting SME trade growth. So particularly the smaller businesses who will find it trickier, more difficult to export, you know, stand to reap the benefits from these, um, these changes. In addition to that, there's some real efficiency savings as well. The numbers are huge, 24 billion pounds. But really, you know, if you kind of equate that to a per transaction cost, the ICC say that, you know, trade costs could come down by as much as 80%, which, you know, particularly for smaller businesses who are finding it difficult or haven't actually started trading internationally, you know, will be a real enabler to drive that international trade side of their, uh, their business. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I think when you look at the business case and and the 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 reasoning and rationale behind this, the benefits are huge, not just in cost or processing time, but in the fraud, the risk, the loss of paper going missing. When you've got so much paper flying around, it's obviously clear um, it goes missing. And I think when you look at just on Roger's point there around, we are starting to see new opportunities coming up with some of the people that we're working with and potentially transactions that would not have happened because of the paper restriction are now able to happen because they're done digitally and the speed and the transaction time is is massively reduced on that. And that's a really good point, isn't it? Because the majority of international trade, if you think about it from a UK perspective, we know about 11% of businesses in the UK export the vast majority of those are large corporates so we really are behind the curve versus germany the netherlands the united states and others in terms of supporting smaller and medium-sized businesses to export so to your point alex hopefully these these changes are a real enabler for sme trade growth um as much as anything absolutely yeah and i think you know from our perspective at ano particularly during the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic, the number of exam questions we had about pieces of paper not being where they needed to be, people not being available to sign, it's kind of really put into, into focus just how needed this is. But maybe I'll just, for the audience, why can't we then just go to digital? What's the problem? The problem is something which we call the possession problem. So the types of documents that we use every day, day in, day out, you, you spoke a bit about the scale of just how many of these are floating around. Bills of lading, warehouse receipts, some insurance documents, bills of exchange, promissory notes. Now they all hinge off being able to be capable of possessed and for the holder to be able to require the obligations that those documents set out by possessing those documents. And the problem is, or was, the English law in common with many other legal systems, because actually these kind of laws are remarkably consistent around the world, did not recognise the idea of being able to possess something that was intangible. So that was, a, in a nutshell, the key legal problem that needed to be fixed. Sarah, maybe you could tell us a little bit about that from your perspective, how you came to be involved, what the Law Commission's role was in all of this. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I I think I probably came to be involved because this the problem that you've just referred to, the possession problem, which is real sort of lawyer's law until you practically encounter it and wonder why you can't use an electronic document in exactly the same way as you can a paper document. That was something that I was a, an, an academic before I was at the Law Commission and that was something that I had written about for uh, many years. So it was great to be able to come to the Law Commission and, and try and do something about it um, in, in practice. And so what we were asked to do at the Law Commission, as we are for all of our projects, is to make sure that the law remains modern, fair and accessible, um, essentially fit for purpose. And of course, what's happening in commerce and has been happening for a few years is that people want to use electronic documents. They have been using electronic documents, but only by means of legal workarounds. And what we really wanted to do is to make the legal position such 
that electronic trade documents or electronic documents could be used in exactly the same way as paper. And as you've already said, Catherine, the problem with that is that we all accept that paper can be possessed. But until quite recently, if you put something in digital form, it wasn't clear that that could replicate paper, that it would have the same factual effect in the world um, as a paper document. So if you think about what I suppose now are quite old-fashioned digital documents, take a Word document, that doesn't necessarily replicate paper most of the time because when I pass um, a copy of it to you, I keep a copy, I don't divest myself of it, it's not unique and singular in the way that we need these digital documents to be because these digital documents represent and embody legal rights. So you don't want to duplicate those every time you pass a document on. So what we wanted to do was make the law such that electronic documents have that same legal recognition. And of course, the technology is now there at the moment. It's largely distributed ledger technology. It won't always be. But the technology is there now to enable these documents to replicate paper so that when I pass my document on, I no longer have it. Um, and the person who receives that, the transferee, gets the full effect of that singular document. So that's what the ETD Act does essentially says where a digital document replicates its paper counterpart, the law will treat it as if it is paper. With the launch of Plugin 2.0, there is some exciting developments. Check this out. This is tweeted out from 11 PPN. Great report on Plugin 2.0 feeds. So this is a really exciting report. 2.0 had already started, but now the Mods Validator node has officially started the job on a mainnet and is continuing to complete the job extremely smoothly. So this is really great progress, he state. I just wanna highlight this right here. Look at plugin compared to Chainlink built on Ethereum. I mean, there's no comparison. Look at the fee, the data feed uh, usage fee right there. $6.36 on Chainlink compared to a little over a penny with Ply. I mean, there's no comparison. This is awesome right here, this hackathon event. So plugin, XCC's decentralized Oracle, they posted step into a new era of gaming and fuse a plugin 2.0's VRF functionality. Create games where every move is unpredictably thrilling, offering a level of fairness excitement. Never seen before, your innovation could revolutionize the gaming landscape. Pretty awesome, let's check and see what this is about. So about the event. So welcome to Ply Hackathon 2.0, building upon resounding success of last year's Ply blockchain event. This exciting event is tailored for passionate students eager to explore the world of blockchain technology. Pretty awesome. As you can see here, you can register here. And I'm going to put this in the description if you are interested. Well, everybody, that's all I have for the video. I hope you did enjoy it. If you did, please subscribe and don't forget to hit the like. If you subscribe, you can stay up to date with fresh content. Thank you.